We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela Dei Mater Alma At the Semper Virgo Felix Tempor Welcome everybody, Steve Cunningham with Cesar Fidel. I'm coming at you with another book review and uh, we're going to talk about one of the most beautiful churches in Rome. You, know, you might be thinking, the Vatican, no. Nope. Or uh, St. Peter's, no. Nah. St. Paul outside of Wallace, no, nah, not happening. Uh, what else is out there? Lawrence, no. Nah. Uh, the one down the street, the Holy Apostles, not nah, happening. St. Onofro <laughs> Algia Colo, I butchered it, I guarantee. But anyway, John Paul Soonan is the guy that wrote the book on this. You can get it. Well, there's a photo of it. I'll have it on linked underneath in the show notes. Uh, Ruko Press has it. Uh, Journey into the Citadel of Faith. So you might not know about this uh, church, but you will at the, by the end of this thing and may want to go. As I saw one of the reviews of Father uh, Abernathy, who's an oratorian, and we'll get into Philip Neary and his connection. He found this so fascinating. He can't wait to go to Rome to check it out. So, JP, welcome. Thanks, brother, for coming on. How you doing? And uh, I'll, I know you came out long ago, but congrats anyways on the book. And uh, how you doing? No, it's great. Good to be here, Steve. Thank you. This book was a labor of love. It was eight years in the making. Uh, so as you know, I was a tour guide in Rome for eight years uh, as I completed my graduate studies, the Angelicum. And like many graduate students in Rome, I was broke. I had no money. So I needed employment. And two days after I arrived, I was offered a job to be a tour escort. And then that led to being a tour docent and tour guide. And I was doing the Vatican Museums and St. Peter's Basilica and Sistine Chapel. And after every tour, uh, the clients would always say, can we buy you lunch? Can we hang out? And then they'd ask, you know, can you show us around the rest of Rome for the rest of the day? Or can we meet tomorrow? Can you show us the Palatine, the Forum, the Colosseum? Uh, can you accompany us on day trips uh, around Rome? So. The longer I was there, uh, the more tours I began to lead. And when I when I started as a tour guide, somebody told me, Rome is a church of 450 churches, so you will never uh, be able to learn all of those churches. You'll never be able to visit all those churches, but, but have a select few churches in Rome that you really like, uh, that you can really uh, study up on and know well. And I fell in love with this church, San Onofrio, which is a church that nobody has ever been to. It's usually locked. It's only open in the morning. Uh, there's no daily mass there. It's actually not even a, a parish uh, under the Vicariate of Rome. So, But it's the first time I visited this church was in 1998 when I was a 19-year-old college student uh, visiting Rome, and I stumbled upon it completely uh, by accident. It's an off-the-beaten-path parish uh, uh, church. and uh, But fortunately, uh, when I was there that day, as a 19 year old, uh, and there's an exterior shot. Um, and you'll notice it doesn't look like a church from the exterior. It has that little bell tower, but other than that, uh, you know, a lot of people just walk by it. They don't even think twice, but. What, do you think it's a Burger King or something? I mean, how do you not think that's a church? <laughs> I know. In Rome, all the, all the buildings are beautiful, right? But, but the moment you look at it, the front of it, you can see it has a Renaissance loggia. And that loggia is you see all those columns and those arches, right? And it used to be a two-story loggia, uh, which is what they would have had in Florence. But, but that upper loggia was covered in brick uh, to make more room uh, in, in the second story many years ago. But it's, uh, it's one of those churches where there's just so many churches in Rome. Uh, it's always overlooked. It, it's kind of dilapidated and falling apart. But, but that first time I visited, fortunately... Uh, we were in the courtyard, it was raining, we were looking around and uh, this elderly man popped his head through a door there in the courtyard. He said, come on in, come on in. He was the sacristan and vieni, venite, he said, and showed us the sacristy and turned on the lights and showed us the church and it was amazing. So 
I fell in love with this church. And in my eight years as a tour guide, I brought a lot of people here to visit it. And people would always ask me, is there a book you can recommend on this church? Uh, it was amazing, the art, the architecture. Um, and I, my answer was always no. Unfortunately, there's no book on it. Um, but then uh, there was a lady who said to me, well, why, do, why don't you write a book on it? And <laughs> I'll then get right to it. <laughs> something, yeah, exactly. I know. I said, lady, I said, I've never written a book. I'm not the type of guy that would ever write a book. Um, it's, yeah, it's not going to be me, but I had some extra time on my hands. So I sat down and finished writing this book, uh, which I had been kind of writing for a while, but it was all just kind of notes and things kind of, uh, just a whole jumble, really sit down each day and then just, uh, crank it out and, uh, and tell the story of this amazing church. Uh, this is the first book that's ever been written on this church that I know of. Um, it is one of Rome's best kept secrets. Uh, it's not a Baroque church. It's a Renaissance church. So it's very different than, than anything a lot of people have seen, but it is absolutely amazing. Let's get into the, 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 the name, the saint that is even named after, uh, I'm going to butcher it, but he's got a heck of a barber. <laughs> Who is he? And why, why, why is it important for the parish? So he, he's a saint that's not very well known in, in, in this part of the world. So he's more well known in Portugal. He's more well known in southern Italy and Sicily. Um, he's more well known in, uh, in the Greek world and in, in the Byzantine world. Um, there is actually a beach in California named after him. Oh, really? <laughs> from the Spanish. So, but, uh, but San Onofrio was an Egyptian um, monk. He was a hermit. He was a Cenobitic monk. So he, he lived under, under the care of an abbot, under the authority of an abbot. But he lived in the desert, the Theban desert in Egypt uh, in the fourth century AD. And the reality is we don't know that much about him. Uh, what we know about him comes from uh, the Egyptian Christians, the Coptic tradition. And they have a writing, a narrative by an abbot named Pompnuncius who tells us the whole story of his encounter, his meeting with San Onofrio in the desert uh, in Egypt. And Onofrio was part of that first migration of, uh, part of that first establishment of, of, of monasticism in the Christian tradition, which, uh, which came from Egypt and then spread from, from east to west. But he was part of that first migration of hermits. <clears throat> and so with the permission of his abbot, he went out and lived uh, in the desert <clears throat> and uh, miraculously survived many years. But then uh, his story gets interesting where uh, this, this abbot, Pomnuncius, visits him and they stay up all night chatting. And, and then in the morning, uh, Anufrio announces that he's going to die uh, that day, that moment. And he, uh, he gives up his soul. Uh, he dies. And then, um, then this monk, uh, this abbot uh, who, who was with him then, um, returns back to civilization, returns back to the monastery to share the story of San Onofrio. So San Onofrio is a saint that goes way, way, way back, 4th century AD. There is a very, very long tradition in the East of, of honoring his memory. So even though we don't know that much about him, we do know that he existed. He is in the Roman martyrology. In the Latin church, his feast day is June 13th. And, uh, and we have a long history of, uh, of, of stories and poems and music and the Coptic tradition uh, surrounding his life and miracles. And we have, of course, the testimony of his miracles, which is huge. So as Belloc says, you know, a lot of these saints, you know, there's legend intertwined with history, but 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 legend is something of substance, right? Legend is coming from these different oral histories and written histories that are combined uh, that help us uh, get a better picture of these characters. <laughs> I can imagine if that happened when he came down and told everybody, I just got done talking to him and I killed him. If he had a friend that said, <laughs> you're so boring, the man died. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's, it's interesting because... Uh, someone had to bury him. So that's kind of the cool mm -hmm. part. So when he dies, um, the idea is that, that he didn't, he didn't die alone because, uh, as you know, in the Catholic tradition, as the same with Judaism and, and Islam and so many other 
religions, we bury our dead. So even the hermits, you know, the body is sacred. So he, uh, it's kind of a beautiful thing that, that he gave up his soul. Uh, he fell asleep in the Lord in that moment. But then there was someone there to minister to him uh, in his final moment. And then actually to uh, bury the body and do the, uh, the whole funeral uh, absolution. So that, that was pretty cool. So is this connected to church? Going back to the church now, is uh, it connected to the uh, Crusades somehow? Or is that what it was? Yeah. So, so what happened is, uh, so this church was built by a bunch of hermits in Rome. And it was the first uh, group of hermits uh, that were living in Rome. And and it was a strange thing because, uh, you know, it was something coming from the East. It was coming from Egypt. It wasn't something that had ever really been done in Rome. And these two guys founded the order. And then uh, it was it was the Pope who gave them this, this land up on a hill near the Vatican. So that this church is located very close to the Vatican. And in those days, there was nobody up there. It was just a home oak grove. So it was a forest. It was woods uh, on a hill. And even in, in Roman times, no one lived there just because it was so inaccessible. There was like an old donkey trail dating back to the late Roman period. And so these two hermits went up there. The Pope gave them the land, and then they wanted a church. And so that was in 1419. Uh, and then the church was completed in 1444. Uh, but they, they, <clears throat> these, these uh, original hermits followed the rule of St. Augustine, and they called themselves the poor hermits of St. Jerome, the mm -hmm. Euronymites. So a great devotion to Augustine, great devotion to Jerome, uh, great devotion to Sa Sant'Onofrio. And, uh, and then, you know, their order grew and grew and flourished. And then the, the, they built this beautiful church, which the book is about, which was completed in 1444. And then that coincided beautifully with the High Renaissance. So the High Renaissance started kind of in 1490 until about the sack of Rome in 1527. So as God would have it, as divine providence would have it, they built this beautiful church. And then the High Renaissance comes. And then they have these amazing guys, Karachi and Domenichino and, and Baldessari Peruzzi, these great Renaissance artists who then painted the interior. So this is a church which is so historical, so important, so amazing. Uh, Michelangelo himself would have come here and prayed. Uh, he would have studied the frescoes by Peruzzi. Uh, even Martin Luther, when he uh, the, the, the instigator of the Protestant revolt, uh, would have visited this church when he was in Rome. And as a side note, you know, when Martin Luther was in Rome, and this gives you a, just a glimpse of his confused uh, kind of ecclesiology, Eucharistic theology. He, uh, he would walk around Rome all day long celebrating one mass after another in church after church after church. So um, you can imagine how kind of redundant that would have felt, how, how excessive. So, I mean, that could have been five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten masses a day. Um, but in any event, uh, this is a church which was prominent at, prominent enough that he would have visited it. Uh, St. Philip Neri came here, but the connection with the Crusades goes back to a guy named Torquato Tazo, who was the greatest bard or the greatest poet of, of the late Renaissance period. And he, he came here to die here. He died at, at this church at age 51. He uh, had a host of, of, of issues, medical problems. He was uh, bipolar and, uh, had a whole series of nervous breakdowns, but he wrote the most famous poem of that period, which was called Rome, uh, or rather Jerusalem Delivered. And that poem became super, super famous on the European continent all through uh, the 16th, 17th, uh, 18th, and really 19th centuries. And so uh, so that that poem is, is it's an epic poem, so it's very long. It's like a 12-hour poem uh, when you read it, but it's, it's really a book, and it's... Uh, the story of, of 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 the first crusade. So it's it's uh, it's an embellishment. It's a fictional account of the first crusade, but it tells the story of Godfrey of Boulogne, uh, Sir Godfrey of Boulogne, who was the uh, who was the general uh, who led the first crusade, and and so Tazo is buried there. So you see pictures of his tomb here on the right. Um, that's a statue of him, a 19th century statue. Uh, where he's looking up to the heavens there. Uh, and then in the middle image, you have a fresco of done uh, during the uh, pontificate of Pius IX when that chapel was uh, 
was redone uh, to include his tomb. And then on the left, we have a plaque in Latin dedicated to the memory of Tazo in the back of the church, uh, telling pilgrims that he is buried in the sanctuary. But what happened is uh, he was originally buried in the sanctuary, but then they, they removed him and put him in this back chapel and they built this massive tomb uh, designed by Canova in the 19th century because so many people were coming there uh, to visit his tomb, to pay their respects, uh, because he was kind of like a celebrity. He was, uh, he kind of had movie star status at that time because he was considered uh, one of the greatest poets in the Christian world. Hmm. Um, and then he died, as I mentioned, at age 51. He's buried there. Um, he never married. He never had kids. But uh, the museum there is dedicated to his honor, which is in the monastery attached to the church. So I always encourage people, you know, Tazo, he's an, a very important poet in, in the history of Christian literature. He's uniting kind of the ancient with the modern. Uh, and, you know, it's... Uh, he no longer has a universal appeal because a lot of people, you know, people's tastes have, have changed. But if you go on YouTube, you can actually watch. Uh, there's a 12-hour reading of his of his poem, uh, Jerusalem uh, Conquered. So I, I tell people, you know, read his poem, his poems, his poetry. It's, you know, homeschool families. There's a lot of value there. Uh, you can buy his books on, on eBay original you know edition some of them in italy going back to the 16th century a lot of editions done uh in the 19th century in english in london and new york but a uh, very interesting character and he died in 1595 and that's the same year that saint philip neri died and saint philip neri loved this church he would visit it all the time in the summer in fact uh he would lead his his groups of young men up here to San Onofrio because uh, in those days there were vineyards, there were there was acreage of uh, beautiful vines and things, and that, that was all torn out in the 19th century when they uh, after the unification of Rome when they they built up uh, the whole city. So all the beautiful gardens and and a greater part of the monastery and the courtyards and and the splashing fountains, all of that was destroyed. Uh, beginning in the 1870s when that whole neighborhood was settled and the Jesu Bambino uh, hospital was was expanded there and and uh, so all that's left now is is this old church San Onofrio dating back to 1444 Renaissance church amazing art amazing history uh, and just uh, just an incredible place to visit so the book uh, is kind of an invitation for people to visit here I really hope that uh, People will buy the book. Uh, it's divided into four sections. The last section is a self-guided tour. So I always remind people when you buy the book, uh, I hope you'll read it uh, and then bring it with you when you go to Rome. Uh, visit this church. Visit it in the morning when it's open. Bring the book. Do the self-guided tour in section four. Give yourself about an hour. It's absolutely amazing. Before we uh, before we uh, tell the people to go uh, get their plane tickets right now, what, what's the deal with uh, Pius the uh, Twelfth on this? So, so Pius the Twelfth uh, loved Tazo the poet, and loved Jerusalem delivered his poem on the First Crusade, and Pius the Twelfth was part of a generation, uh, having grown up in the late nineteenth century, where Tazo was still studied in the Liceo in Italy, and. Uh, so it was, it was a very important part of their humanistic formation, uh, you know, with that influence coming from the Renaissance. So, so he knew Tazo's uh, poetry. He memorized Tazo's poetry. Poetry was a big part of their culture, and it's a big part of the Italian spirit. They're a very sentimental people. So, so Pius XII uh, was always uh, promoting Tazo. He would sometimes come here and visit his tomb. And what happened is after World War II, when Europe was in shambles, uh, the Pope knew that, you know, uh, you know, Europe had really failed. Europe had really come up uh, uh, short. You know, Italy with the fascism, uh, Germany with the National Socialism. Uh, Europe was in rubble. Italy was just hit really hard with, with the war. Nine months, the Nazis were in Rome. So he wanted to expand this the chivalric order, the chivalric movement called the Equestrian Order, the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. And that is a chivalric order of the church, one of only two that dates back to um, really about, about a thousand years ago, to the year 1099, to the end of the First Crusade. 
uh, founded in Jerusalem of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So, so he knew the order would be growing and expanding, and given all the circumstances in Europe at that time, he knew that, that it, more Americans would be joining, more Canadians, that it would be more of a global thing. So in 1945, he gave this church to that order, to the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. Um, so, that, so the church is now under their direction. It's under their care. Uh, they have offices there. They, um, they, they, they sometimes have liturgies there, but not as often because the order has just exploded in growth. So in Rome, they have most of their events at the Lateran Arch Basilica just to accommodate the crowds. But so, yeah, so Pius XII was a big fan of this church, loved it, uh, gave it to uh, the Equestrian Order and then put it under the direction of Cardinal Canali, uh, who was a good close friend of his. And, uh, and then there's a connection with Pius X because Pius X uh, <coughs> was a member of the order as well and gave them their modern habit and, uh, and so on and so forth. So lots of interesting connections uh, with all the popes through the centuries and, and, uh, and even Garibaldi. Uh, so when he sacked, sacked Rome uh, in 1870, when he came and uh, he d descended upon the holy city during that time of Masonic revolution, he he invaded all these church, churches and he stole all the bronze and anything he could melt down for weapons and armament uh, and all the chalices and ciboria and candelabras and all this stuff he took, chandeliers. and But when he came to San Onofrio, uh, his men were going to take the bells down. And there's only a couple small bells there, but they were going to melt them down. And one of the monks said, no, please, that, that, that little bell was tolling when Tazo died. But Garibaldi himself had such an interest in, in Torquato Tazo, the poet, and his poem, Jerusalem Delivered, that Garibaldi um, said, okay, leave the bells. Don't take these bells. Don't touch them. The bells stay. So so they they, they looted all these other churches, but but the Masons, they didn't touch this church because, uh, because of that connection. And then the monks showed, uh, they brought Garibaldi up to show him uh, and Garibaldi, of course, was a louse. He was a murderer. He was a he was a, a bad apple. But but they showed him the room where Tazo died, which is uh, the second story, on the right side there in the image, and uh, that room is still a museum to this day. So, you know, high school kids in Italy they'll come here and visit. Uh, they'll see the tomb, and you'll see them reciting his poetry, and and they'll visit the room where he died, and and uh, so it's just it's an amazing amazing uh, place to visit. But it's, it's off the beaten path, so it's not on one of Rome's seven hills. It's actually uh, west of the Tiber River uh, on a different uh, hill outside of what would have been formerly ancient Rome. But it's right south of the Vatican. It's on the Giannicolo Hill. It's impossible for Americans to pronounce Giannicolo. They call it Giannicolo. Uh, but in English, it's Giannicolo. But I'll tell you something else which is kind of cool. So the air at this church is considered really clean and special because there's a microclimate here because you're on top of this hill and that breeze that air comes from from the mediterranean from from from, from the sea and uh so it comes it sweeps off the off off the the, the Tyrrhenian, the mediterranean and uh and then it, it 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 kind of sweeps across the tops of these hills so so in the summertime it's a little cooler here uh that's from that breeze coming from the mediterranean and really coming from Africa. In fact, it's coming from the Sahara Desert because uh, when it carries what's called the Scirocco, which comes at a certain time of the year in Rome, it carries a dust, kind of a dirt, which is actually sand from the desert uh, mm -hmm. in North Africa, which comes and then sweeps over uh, here, the, the hill and the church and everything. And it's, it's just like a little film. You'll see it in the morning, like on the windshields of cars up here, where it's, uh, you see, well, you see, well, that's the desert sand, that's the Scirocco. Uh, coming from uh, from Africa. So for that reason, Tasso came here to die as well because uh, he wanted to be under the care of the monks, but but it was considered better for, for people with respiratory issues uh, uh, just because the air is cleaner. But So there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's, it's an amazing place. But one of the points I make in the book, which is really important, is that we want people to visit Rome not as a tourist, but as a pilgrim. And there's a difference because... Most people go to Rome as a tourist. You know, they're there to take pictures and have a good time and check off things on their bucket list. But we really always uh, emphasize as tour guides in Rome and the Vatican, you know, when you make your pilgrimage to Rome, Videre Petrum, to see Peter, 
you really want to make sure uh, you're keeping the idea of metanoia in mind, which is which means conversion of heart. Uh, that's really important, that focus. And you always want to make an intention in the medieval tradition before you make a pilgrimage. So always have that in mind. Uh, make your intention. Uh, God will honor your prayers. Uh, start the pilgrimage. Go to Rome. Um <clears throat> and 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 go go with the idea of conversion in mind of metanoia and and one of the points i make in the book is that part of that whole experience of pilgrimage and metanoia um is is has to do with an encounter with beauty and uh my experience having lived in rome all those years as a tour guide and accompanying people on their journeys through the vatican museums for many many years and all those hundreds and thousands of, of clients i had is it's so important, uh, that encounter with beauty. And, and the Catholic Church has such sympathy for man that, that the Catholic Church really is the only universal religion that promotes beauty uh, the way we do. And uh, knowing that beauty is, is a theological category, that there's an actual theology of beauty, um, that it has to do with the transcend transcendentals, that it is a, a transcendental, uh, along with we have truth and beauty and goodness, the bonum, verum, and pulcrum, as Aristotle said. And so all of this is an encounter with beauty. This whole experience of pilgrimage, this whole experience of visiting this church. And this church is always empty. When you visit, you'll find you're the only person there. It's just you and the art and the history and, uh, and all of these holy people whose lives have been led there. And, uh, and it's all original. It's all untouched. Uh, it's like going back in time. Again, I'll have a link underneath in the show notes. Uh, JP, you also do uh, pilgrimages itself. Uh, are you planning any tours specifically to Rome? And I would assume if you did, you might make a little pit stop. Like, hey, we're going this way and we're going to check out this particular church. Is that in the... Are you thinking, is that happening? Are you doing that? Or? Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the mix. So we uh, we like to lead our, our, our groups to Rome in, in conjunction with the annual Simodum Pontificum Conference. So that's always the end of October, early November, uh, in, in conjunction with the, the Feast of Christ the King on the old calendar. So we are planning the mother of all pilgrimages to Rome. Uh, I think it'll be in 2024, although it still could be in 2023. We're in negotiations right now uh, for that. But another thing we're doing is we're bringing back our uh, VIP traditional Catholic Holy Land pilgrimages. So now that uh, the whole COVID thing is behind us and the borders have opened, we are leading a VIP pilgrimage to the Holy Land uh, in May. Love to encourage any of you to join us. And that is with Regina Magazine. That's reginamagazine.org. And then we're doing another one, a Latin Mass one in November, December. And uh, we're inviting people to join us on that one as well. Uh, that'll be with the EF, the Extraordinary Form. And both of those tours will be in 2023, so just around the corner. Uh, can't wait to get back. It's uh, Jerusalem is amazing. Uh, Rome is amazing. Um, I really think every living Christian, every Catholic, um, should at some point uh, really, really make it a goal to visit both Rome and Jerusalem. Uh, it's a life-changing experience. Uh, the Holy Land, Jerusalem, because you're walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, and Rome, because there you visit uh, the tomb of the Prince of the Apostles, St. Peter, who, after seven years in Antioch, went to Rome, lived in Rome, died in Rome. He was murdered there. He was martyred, uh, and then he was buried there in the Vatican Hill, and, of course, St. Peter's Basilica is built just over his tomb. And uh, so, yeah, so we're getting back into tours. Uh, keep, keep, we'll keep doing that, God willing. Uh, Again, that's uh, St. Onofrio's Journey to the Cit Citadel of Faith by John Sunan. Rick Aruka uh, Press. I am butchering the English language today. You're doing uh, great. You might want to make a publishing company that you could just say the words and I know Anafro, if he was in kindergarten, he probably would fail because he couldn't spell his name. But uh, so No, it's all good, Steve. Thank you. And thanks for putting in a plug for Ruka Press. So the publisher is amazing. Um, that's Aruka. They're, they're Canadians. They're based in Toronto. 
They are the new up and coming. Their books are are phenomenal. Really, 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 really fascinating. So everybody check out Aruka Press. Amazing stuff. Alex is their is their head uh, or, uh, proprietor, their head editor. He's amazing. And uh, their stuff is really impressive. So everybody do check out Aruka Press. Yeah, I try to go for the regular uh, the direct link instead of uh, helping out Bezos, anyways, uh, shape or form. But yeah, everybody avoid Amazon because uh, Amazon, you know, they take up to like a sixty percent cut. So if you can order direct from the publisher, you know, so even though they're based in Canada, these books are all printed in the U.S. So the just dis- distribution centers are in Illinois and Pennsylvania, and and you'll get the book like that. It's only 1995. It's it's 20 bucks well spent, and uh, and I hope I really hope it'll encourage you to visit Rome and uh, visit in a spirit of pilgrimage and and, and really pr- prepare your hearts uh, t- to encounter beauty. I right, appreciate JP. Appreciate your time, man. Thanks again, and uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Steve.